Praise the Lord. We'll close our eyes as we pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this time. We thank you for what you are doing already. We thank you for what you are still going to do. We ask, O oh Lord, you open eyes of understanding in your word tonight in Jesus' name. And we're asking, O oh Lord, you touch every heart, touch every life, transform our lives by the teaching of the word in Jesus' name. Grant us understanding in the word. And we pray, Lord, the understanding we have will make us to move forward and make progress in our Christian lives and leadership and the work we're doing for the Lord in, G in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you very much. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm going to read from verse 5. And we're looking at it all through to verse 10. Hebrews chapter 12, reading from verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with you. As with sons, for what son is he, whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have heard fathers of our flesh, which corrected us. And we gave them reverence, respect, and honor. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they very live for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he referring to God for a profit, that we might be partakers of his Holiness. Look at that verse 10 again. They are earthly parents, very and truly, for a few days, for a, few, for a short period, chastened us, corrected us, rebuked us, reproved us. And it says, after their own pleasure, because they have some things to bring out in our lives. And they have some ways they want to direct us. And they have something they want to achieve. The goal they want to achieve after their pleasure. But now he's talking about God in verse 10. And he says, but he, but the heavenly father, but the one that knows us within and without, that knows our past and our future, the one that knows our strength and weakness, and the one that knows the possibilities in our lives for our own profit. Look at that. It says, it's for our profit. For our progress and it is for our growth in the Lord that he now corrects us and chastises us that we might be tell me the partakers of his holiness and you know this talking to all the children of God you are born again you are a child of God you are born again you are the family of God you are born again and you claim the name of the Lord Jesus it says for all his children he corrects everyone he directs everyone. He controls everyone. And he says he does that. It's not quiet that now you are born again. Okay, I leave you to yourself. Now you are a child of God. I leave you to yourself. Now that you have come into the kingdom, I can leave you to yourself. He said, no. He says if we're children of God, every one of the children of God, the young and the old, the men and the women, the workers and the leaders and the members and the ministers, everyone, he chastises, he corrects, he leads, he controls, he rebukes, and he reproves so that we might be partakers of his holiness. And I pray that the Lord will grant understanding in Jesus' name. I want you to look at your word here. The word chastening, or the word chastises, or the word scourges, or the word 
chastisement. I'm coming back to verse 5 again. Look at verse 5. It says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto the children. My son, every child of God, my son, every believer, my son, everyone that comes into the kingdom. It says, My son, despise not, look at the word, the chastening of the Lord. The chastening of the Lord. Go on. In verse 5 it says, Now faint when thou art rebuked of him, reproved of him, corrected by him. I didn't look at verse 6 to find that word again. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he, tell me the word, he chastineth. And you see that in the present continuous because he loves us. He doesn't want us to perish. He doesn't want us to backslide. He doesn't want us to go back. Because of that, he wants progress. He wants improvement. And because he's looking for our profit, our progress, our improvement, that's why it says in that verse 6, whom he loveth, he chastineth. Look at the next word. And, chast and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That is, uh, you have received the Lord Jesus Christ and he receives you. You receive him to your heart. He receives you into the kingdom. And he accepts you. He says, so a child of God, he says, so one of his children, because of that, he scourges everyone, every child, every son whom he receiveth. He's talking about his correction. He does that for the individual. He does that for the family. He does that for an assembly. He does that for a nation, for the nation of Israel. He corrected them. He chastised them. When they were going the wrong way, he said, no, you can't go that way. And he brought rebuke and correction unto them. Look at verse 7. You see that word again. If ye endure, tell me the word, chastening. If he endure chastening, it must be mightily important for the Lord to be mentioning chastisement or chastening or chastises in every verse as we're going through from verse 5 to verse 6 to verse 7. And it says, if he endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastineth not, except where orphans? Except we're not real children. It says you're a real, you're a real child in the family of God. And God recognizes that you're a real child in the family of God. If you go wrong, it's not going to look at you and just leave you like a stranger. Like somebody who is not in the kingdom. Like a foreigner. is a child of the devil. He just strayed into my assembly. He strayed into my family. Leave him alone. Ephraim is gone after the idols. Leave him alone. It's not going to do that. Because he accepts you, and because he receives you, and because he counts you as a pilgrim on your way to heaven, a member of the family of God, he corrects, he says, look at verse 8 now, but if he be without, tell me that word again, chastisement, is mentioning everywhere, every time, in all those verses, if you, he says, if you be without chastisement, whereof all are Partakers, look at that. All are partakers. All the young believers, the adult believers, the old believers, the experienced believers, the inexperienced believers, the very strong believers, and the weak believers. It says all are partakers. Those who are working for him and those who are leading in the household of faith. It says all are partakers. The people that are experienced in the work of the Lord and the those who have just come into the ministry of the word, it says all are partakers. Check up your life. When last did God tell you in your conscience, that's not right? When last did God tell you in your heart, don't go that way? When last did your conscience beat you, smart you, scorch you? and made you feel unhappy with something that had happened. If that never happens, it says watch it. Because all are partakers of correction. All are partakers of chastisement. All are partakers of his rebuke. It says uh, in verse 8, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye, tell me that word there, bastards are not sons. 
the people that you know they, they never have any correction never have any rebuke and never have any kind of chastisement never have any kind of pricking in their conscience that that's not right don't go that way that's not right don't sit down there that's not get up there that's not don't say that. that's not right don't eat nothing don't touch nothing and they never 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 have any challenge or corrections ah look at that it says they are bastards and not sons you know there are people that take pleasure and joy in the fact that you know I can do anything and nobody in the church can challenge me. I can go anywhere and no leader in the church can challenge me. And they tell us I can, you know, I can even deliberately do something that I know that that thing is wrong. And I'm waiting for them. And you know, I've got to the level that nobody ever, ever can challenge me. It says, watch it. That person is not a child of God. It says that person is not a member of the family of God. It says that person is a bastard. It's not a son. It says, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Look at verse 9. Furthermore, we have heard fathers of our flesh, natural fathers, natural parents, which corrected us. That's the same word. Corrects us, chastises us, coaches us, which corrected us. And we give them reverence. We respect the parents that correct us as their children. We respect the parents that do not want us to go astray. And they say, my child, you know, if you are not my child, I won't talk about this. I won't even mention this. I can see you do this. If you are a stranger, a boy under the bridge, a girl on the street, if you are just in the neighborhood, I wouldn't talk about this. But you know, because you are my son, because you are my daughter, I'm going to talk about this. And you know why? I have a great future for you. I have a great, great expectation of you. And that's the reason I'm talking about this. That's what he's saying here. It he says, Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we give them honor, respect, reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and labor? That is, when he corrects us, when he chastises us, when he reproves us, when he rebukes us, then we bend low before him in humility. And then we say, I know you love me because you are my father. That's why you are doing that to me. Look at verse 10. For they, the earthly fathers, verily, certainly, surely, for a few days, just a short period of time, just us after their own profit, after their own pleasure, but he for our profit. Ah, correction is for our profit. Rebuke is for our profit. Challenges, that's for our profit. Don't stay there. That's for our profit. Get up out of there, out of that place. That's for our profit. Uh -uh. You cannot behave like other people. You cannot talk like other people. You cannot dress like other people. Don't you know who you are? No, you can't do this. We're not going to allow you to do this. That's for our profit. But if that never comes to you, if correction never comes from the Heavenly Father, and you can mediate that correction through your pastor, through your leader, and through the local assembly right there. But it's still coming from him. And it says in verse 10, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own profit, but he for our profit, that we might be, you tell me once again, partakers of his holiness. You understand? It's not just Calvary. Yes, Calvary. It's not just the blood of the lamb. Yes, the blood of the lamb. It's not just the truth, the word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. It's not just prayer that we pray and then it purifies our hearts by faith. It says there is still a part of the instrumentality of God. There is still a part of the working of God that he makes use of. He makes use of that we might be partakers of his 
holiness. His holiness, not your own, but his. And he says, he does all this, and I've read it to you from verse 5. All in every verse, chastineth, scourgeth, chastisement, and all that. And then at the end of that passage, he says, the purpose for that is that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now look at verse 11. He says, now, God knows this. You know this. Everybody knows this. It says now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous. It's not pleasure. It's painful. That's why many people, they recoil from correction. Many people, they fight against correction. Many people, they will shield themselves away from rebuke and correction. You know why? Because it's not a pleasure. It's not something we enjoy. It's not something we're expecting. It's not something we're delighting. The Word of God knows that. And it says now, at this present time, in this present world, it says no chastisement and no chastening for the present seem to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, you don't enjoy it. You don't appreciate it. It's not something that brings pleasure and joy, but it says nevertheless, afterward, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's it again. Righteousness, holiness, godliness, the same thing. Righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down. That is, after you have been rebuked, and okay, if they don't want me to, you know, do it the way I want, and that's what they want, and you go this way, they say, come back, they go to church, they say, come back, and they always correct, and okay, I hang my hands now. Hands now. I won't do anything anymore, because they say you don't know how to do it. They say you don't know how to talk. They say you don't know how to do it. They say you don't know how to do it. Okay, okay, if it's like that, I hang down my hand. I'll not do it. He said, don't do that. Lift up the hands that hang down. And then he goes on, it says, and uh, the feeble knees, strengthen the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. You know what it says there? It says, if God corrects you, if God rebukes you, if God chastises you, and then your hands are, you hang your hands down. I won't do anything anymore because, you know, they're always picking up at me. And they always say this, 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 and it's okay. My hands are down. Go and do your work yourself. And then your knees are weak. It says, be careful. If you continue like that, it says, God will replace you. Because the one that is lame, the one that will not move on because of correction, because of rebuke, it will be turned out of the way. I pray you will not be turned out of the way. I said you will not be turned out of the way. It says, make straight paths for your feet. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. You know why? Because in verse 14, follow peace with how many people? All men, all men, uh, you know, the different kinds of men. Some are easy to live with. Some are difficult to live with. Some are just almost impossible. The more you try, the more they make it difficult for you to cope with them. But it says, all men, because you want to get to heaven, because everything that happens here is not the end. It says, because of that, for the peace with all men, and uh, tell me the next word, holiness, holiness, without which no man shall say the Lord. I uh, want to look at the teaching on the heavenly father's investment, the heavenly father's investment in our holiness the heavenly father's investment what he does what he imparts how he adds how he leads how he corrects the investments he has in our lives for our holiness the heavenly father's investment in our holiness there are three things we're going to consider number one the Father's purposeful correction from heaven. The Father's purpose, 
full correction from heaven. Number two, is fear powerful commitment to our holiness. Is committed and is faithful in that. Because from the time, even before you were born again, he's been calling for you, looking for you, and eventually you came. And now that you came into the kingdom, he's watching over you. He said, that's a trophy for the Lord Jesus Christ, my only begotten son. He must get to heaven. She must get to heaven. And because of that, he has a powerful commitment to your holiness. Because without that, you cannot get to heaven. Is fear powerful commitment to our holiness? Number three, our fervent, prayerful consecration with humility in response to that chastisement, in response to that correction, in response to that reprove or rebuke, our fervent, prayerful consecration with humility. Number one. The Father's purposeful correction from heaven. You want to understand that there are times uh, God wants to talk to somebody. And he sends in the Old Testament, he sends a prophet. But that correction from the prophet is not from the prophet, it's from heaven. There are times he wanted to talk to the children of Israel, something had happened. And he says, Moses, come on here. And then he tells Moses, and Moses goes to deliver to them. It's not a message from Moses, it's from heaven. And there are times when God wants to, you know, put somebody like Miriam who had, you know, said what she shouldn't have said, and leprosy came on her. And then the Lord is saying, put her outside the camp for some time. And that's not from Aaron, that's not from Moses, it's from God, it's from heaven. And at times the Lord is correcting you, chastising you, rebuking you, reproving you. And he's saying, I want you to be more holy, and I want you to be more righteous, I want you to be more sober, I want you to be more serious. I want you to be more dedicated. I want you to be more steadfast. I want you to be more single-minded. And because he, have, he has not seen that, he brings chastisement to reprove for correction. And then he goes through an avenue. He goes through an instrument. That's not from the instrument. It's from God himself, from heaven. The Father's purposeful correction from heaven. Look at this again. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 12 verse 5. It says, and ye have forgotten the exhortation. Ye have forgotten. Ye have forgotten. Many of us here were forgotten. We're forgotten that God is Father. We're forgotten that the Father will correct we have forgotten that the Father will reprove. He says, and ye have forgotten uh, the exhortation which says unto you, unto you, unto you in particular, as unto children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint, don't get discouraged, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. We're looking at Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5. Would you know that this, um, uh, this idea or this precept or this principle or this project of God in correcting, in rebuking, in reproving, in, chast in chastening, would you know that it's everywhere in the Bible? Old Testament and New Testament come on to Job chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 17. In Job chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Behold, happy is a man whom God corrected. I didn't know that. Did you know that? What I see is sorrowful is a man whom God corrected. That's what I see. Sad, morose. Is the man, the woman, whom God corrected. That's what I see. Discouraged is a man whom God corrected. That's what I see. Withdrawn is the man whom God corrected. That's what I see. Isn't that what you see? When somebody is corrected, then we're withdrawn. We're sad. We're sorrowful. Why should they tell me that's not right? I know it's not right, but why did they tell me? 
Why did they tell me that that's not perfect? I know it's not perfect, but why did they tell me? Why did they challenge me and correct me that I shouldn't have done that? I know I shouldn't have done that, but why did they tell me? And they're sorrowful. Look at the word of God. In Job chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Behold, tell me the next word there. Happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, it says, because you ought to be happy, despise not the chastening of the Almighty. That's what it says. The next time God corrects you, he might correct you through your local pastor. He might correct you through the overseer. He might correct you through anyone. And he says, uh, my brother, uh, I thought we knew this. We learned it together that this is not right. I thought we knew this together. We shouldn't go that direction. We should be happy that God is dealing with us as children in the family. I'm looking at uh, chapter 33. We're looking at Job chapter 33. And we're reading from verse 14. Job chapter 33 verse 14. It says, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, Yet man perceiveth it not. You know what he's saying here? He's saying God really doesn't need to chastise us. He doesn't need to scourge us. He doesn't need to weep us. He says, you know, the very first thing God will do, once you are going in a particular direction, he will speak. He speaks to your heart. He speaks to your spirit. He speaks to your conscience. And he says, he speaks once. And we didn't get it privately, personally, secretly, behind the curtain. He speaks to you. He speaks through your conscience. That's why I put the conscience there to monitor what we do. And it says in verse 14, it says, For God speaketh once, yet twice, yet man perceiveth it not. That's why he later now has to scourge. That's why he has to chastise because he has used the first method and the first method did not bear any fruit. Look at verse 15. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, his slump brings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. He tries to get our attention and open our ears and say, this is wrong. I want you in heaven. But people who do this and they persist in it and it becomes habitual, they ruin their lives, they never get to heaven. And I want you to get to heaven. It speaks in your conscience, it speaks in your heart, it speaks to your life, it speaks to you in the dream, it speaks to you in various ways. You open your ears to have instruction. It says, look at verse 17, so that, that he may withdraw man from his purpose. He has a purpose that will ruin him. A purpose that will destroy him. A purpose that will hinder him from getting to heaven. And he wants him to get to heaven. And so he speaks to him. He corrects him. He reproves him. He chastises him. So that he will withdraw that man from his purpose. And hide pride from man. But why? Why does he want to hide pride from man? Because he knew that the one thing that brought Lucifer, Satan, down from heaven to earth and is going to spend eternity in hell is pride. And you see that pride that is building up in the, and says, no, that's my child. That's my child. He's following after Lucifer. He's following after Satan. And Satan is, you know, already mad for hell. And that's my child. I don't want him to get to hell. And because he wants to hide pride from the man, he rebukes him this direction, that direction to hide pride from him. He keepeth back his soul from the pitch and his life from perishing by the sword. Look at verse 19. Read it for me. One, two, three, go. Is chastened also with pain upon his bed, and the multitude of his bones was strong pain, so that his life abhorreth bread, and his soul dainty meat, his flesh is consumed away, and it, that it cannot be seen, and his bones that they were not that were not seen stick out. 
Yea, his soul draweth near unto the grave and his life to the destroyer. Look at verse 23. If there be a messenger with him, the man does not understand. The Lord is correcting him. He doesn't understand. The Lord is rebuking him. He doesn't understand. The Lord is saying, you know why this pain is there? I'm trying to correct something. You know why this precious your life? I'm trying to correct something. I don't want you to perish. And the man does not understand. That's why it now says in verse 23, if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, an interpreter that will interpret the actions of God, the chastisement and the rebuke, and an interpreter, one among a thousand. What does that mean? It says if you collect, if you collect 1,000 preachers together, only one has the understanding this is the hand of God. All the other people, they'll be talking about faith. They'll be saying, just believe. If you believe, all things are possible. They'll be saying, just hold on to the promise of God. You cannot hold on to the promise of God. God is correcting something. And when that sin is corrected, you'll come out of the problem. You'll come out of the chastisement. But if the Lord is saying, look at pride. Look at evil. Look at the wrong direction. Look at the lifestyle. This holiness will not get you to heaven. This is not good enough. And this holiness is not transparent enough. And it wants you to be partakers of his holiness. And because of that, he brought that rebuke. He brought that correction. I didn't understand. And there's no repentance. And there's no restoration. And there's no change. And there is no higher holiness in your life. That rebuke will continue. Other people, interpreters and preachers, hold on to God, believe God. It's only one in a thousand that will say, my brother, is there something wrong in your life? Have you thought, let's leave this faith aside. Let's leave it aside. Let's leave all these promises. Push that aside. Is there something that God is correcting in your life? And you need to put that right. That's why it says, if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show unto man his uprightness. Then, after that, he is gracious unto him and says, deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. After the change. After the transformation, after responding to the correction, to the rebuke of the Lord. Look at verse 25. His flesh shall be fresher than a child's. He shall return to the days of his youth. He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him. After the interpreter has now explained to him, you know why this is happening? You know more than this. The life you live is not up to the knowledge of God you have. Not up to the knowledge of the scriptures you have. And it is not up to the knowledge you are teaching other people. That's why this is on you. And it's one interpreter out of a thousand that comes to tell us the right thing. And once he tells us that right thing, and we take that to heart, then God becomes favorable, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will rend out a man his righteousness. Look at chapter 34. Job chapter 34. I'm reading from verse 31. Job chapter 34, verse 31. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have born what? I can't hear my people. I have born chastisement. You see, it's in the scriptures. The chastisement, the reproof, the correction, and the thing that the Lord is saying, I'm the one doing that. You know, there are many people, they attribute every negative thing to Satan. But you know, if you read your Bible, the children of Israel, they were going to the land of Canaan. They became discouraged. And then they started to murmur. And they spoke against God. And they spoke against Moses. And then the Bible says, And the Lord sent, what? Serpents. Not Satan. And the Lord sent. If you remember Job. The Lord said, Job, here am I. Go to Nineveh and do this and do this. And Job, Jonah stood up. And as Jonah stood up, he went into the ship. And then he went the other direction. Who sent the storm? 
God. That's the chastisement. Because he's saying, uh -uh, Jonah, what's the problem with you? You're my servant. I raised you up a prophet. And you're not to tell me where I will send you. I will send you where I want to send you. And I say, go to Nineveh. And then you go the other direction. There was a storm. And the people, they prayed and prayed and prayed. The storm was still there. And Jonah knew. So Jonah went to sleep underneath. Until the shipmaster came and said, watch. Oh sleeper, wake up and call upon your God. And I was surprised the man did not call upon his God. He didn't pray. Why? Why didn't he pray? Because he knew. He knew that I'm going in the right direction. This chastisement is coming from the Lord. And he said, it's because of me. Okay, they said, what are we going to do now? He said, throw me into the sea. And I'm telling you, the storm will stop. Because God has no problem with you. He's not fighting you. But because you harbor me here. You hide me here. You are keeping me here. And I am rebelling against God. I'm telling God that thing you want. I will not do it. And God is saying, Jonah, if you continue like that, there's no holiness there. And I want you to be partaker of my holiness. And I'm not ready yet. So since I'm not ready yet, just throw me overboard. And the people said, we can't do this. And they, they tried and tried and tried. And the storm was still there. Then they prayed unto God and said, God, don't let the blood of this man be upon us. He himself has told us that it's because of him this storm is there. Because this is the chastisement of the Lord. So we're going to throw him over. We don't want to do it, but he said that's the only way. He is not willing to repent here before us. He's not willing to be restored here before us. He's not having the humility to say, okay, God... For the sake of these people, I turn, I repent. And he's still saying, uh, he's going to fight it to the finish. And God is saying, okay, Jonah, let's do it. You want to fight? I'll fight you to the finish too. And so they picked him up. What did they do? They threw him uh, in the sea. What happened immediately after that? The storm was over. That shows you it's God. It's the chastisement of the Lord. Eventually, now when Jonah got to the depths of the sea, then he began to say, God, I see your hand. I'm sorry for this. And once he said, I'm sorry, the Lord commanded the whale and dropped him by the shore near Nineveh. And the word came again. Because you see, what God determines you will do, you will do. And it's better to accept it on the first day. The time, because when he says, Jonah, get up, it's better to get up. Because if you don't, the storm might take a long time. But you know, God doesn't count time. He is the, you know, the ancient of days. He's there for all eternity. He has all the time to finish the work with you. Until you say, Lord, holiness unto the Lord, I surrender. Okay, if you surrender... That message I give you, go to Nineveh and tell them and preach unto them the word I give you. That's why the storm was storm. That's the reason why he's telling us that because we're his children, he chastises, he corrects, he rebukes, and the correction, painful, grievous, is coming from him. And the moment we accept, everything will be all right. It will be all right in your life. Look at verse 31 here. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will offend, I will not offend any more. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, tell me, I will do no more. In Second Chronicles chapter 33. Second Chronicles chapter 33. And I'm reading here from verse 9, 2 Chronicles chapter 33, and we're reading from verse 9. It says in verse 9, 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 9, So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err, to do wrong, to sin, to go astray, and to do worse than the heathen. Whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake to Manasseh. That's his first method. That's the first way. That's the first channel. 
That's the first avenue. He will speak. He speaks to our conscience. He speaks to our hearts. Once we obey, that's all right. But if he speaks and we don't obey, he has another sin, the rod that comes, the chastisement that comes. And he says in verse 10, and the Lord spake unto Manasseh and to his people, but tell me, they were not hacking. Wherefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria. You see, they were instruments in his hand. It says, therefore, because they were not here. That's why I brought the captains of the host of the Assyrians, which took Manasseh among what? The thorns. And bound him with what? fetters and carried him to Babylon. Look at verse, verse 12. And when he was I thought you would tell me in affliction he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of heaven. And he prayed unto him. That's what God is waiting for. Why are we so slow? Why are we so sluggish? Why did we come to late? Why didn't we pray at the first time? When he spoke to us, why didn't we respond? Why do we have to wait to be bound with thorns? Why do we have to wait to be bound with fetters? He has spoken. He has given us the Bible. And then he speaks to our hearts by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. While he was guiding us, why did we go on our knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry about this. I know that this is not right. I've read it in your word that this is not the way I should go. And then everything is settled. Why does man have always to wait for something fiery? For something furious and for something terrifying and for something that is uh, painful. It says, and when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him and he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and he brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord what? It was God. That's what the Lord is telling us. He says we should listen to the Lord and know who has appointed the Lord. We're looking at Micah. Micah it tells us about the rod, the rod of affliction. It tells us about the rod, that is the rod of rebuke, the rod of chastisement. And know that this is not Satan. Know who has appointed this. And then respond in uh, Micah chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 9. Micah chapter 6, verse 9. The Lord's voice cries unto the city. And the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear the rod. The rod has a voice. The rod of chastisement is speaking. He's saying something here. And the rod of rebuke is saying something. Listen. Hear the rod. And who has appointed it? We come to point number two. Point number two is fear powerful commitment to our holiness. It's fair and it's favorable and it's doing that for our holiness. It's fear, powerful commitment to our holiness. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12 and I'm reading now from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 12 and we're reading from verse 9. In 12 verse 9 it says, Furthermore, we have heard fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence, respect, honor, submission. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? It says, the correction is not to destroy us. It's to bring us to submission. It's to bring us to surrender. It's to bring us to repentance. It's to bring us to restoration. And then we'll leave. Look at verse 10. 
For they verily are earthly parents. For they verily are earthly fathers. For they verily are earthly directors and schoolmasters. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. Think about this. They verily for a few days. What does that mean? What that means is that, um, you know, in our earthly family, you are growing up to 16, 17, 18, and your father just realized that, well, now you are 18. And the law of the nation allows you now to be in the adult world. And your father now will change the method. For a few days, they corrected us until 18. Sometimes until 21. For a few days. Because now, the law of the country says you are 21, you can have a passport. You can have a, a driving license. You can have this, you can have that. And you can decide. I don't want to live under that man anymore. I don't want to live under mama anymore. I want to be by myself now. For a few days, they chastened us. Unfortunately, we have not learned the real major lessons of life by 18. Unfortunately, we have not learned the very serious things we need to learn in life that will make us successful. See, we can come out of university. All those things, do you apply chemistry? Do you apply that in normal life? Physics? Do you apply that in normal life? All that was study in mathematics, how does that help when you are getting married? How does that help when you are living together with a wife, with a husband? And all that you have learned in, you know, grammar and English and all those job-breaking vocabularies, what do you know? How will those vocabularies help in uh, leading your life and planning your finances and living the way you ought to live so you don't get into conflict with your neighbors so that you can live a peaceful life? How does that help? When they leave us by 18 or 21, we're just about starting life. And he's saying that, but that's what they do for a few days. And they say, well, I can't talk to him anymore. Now he is a man. I can't talk to her anymore. She is a lady now, although she is my daughter. And they leave us at the point where we actually need now to begin to learn how to live about life. And there are people that transfer that to the Christian life. After one year of conversion, and then we'll come to Bible study for one year, we think we've known everything. And then, I'm not a newcomer now in the church. I've been here for three years. And if anybody said, my friend, look at this, look at this, <laughs> so, I'm not a new convert. I, I, know, I know what I should, I know what I should not do. We, we, we kind of jerk back. We don't want correction. Because we think we've already got everything. And yet, we've just started. We've just started. And that's what the Lord is saying here. And he's telling us now that in verse 9, for a few days, they chastised us, they chastised us and corrected us. In verse 10, but he, the ancient of days, but he, the eternal one, he that knows that we're not there yet, see how mature God is and see how perfect God is. And he looks at our imperfection. Although you've been converted for five years, seven years, ten years, twenty years, thirty years, he can see. And because he can see, he said, I know your earthly parents have given up. I know that your earthly teachers have given up. I know that all, for a few days they've stopped, but I cannot stop because I'm eternal. I'm the ancient of days. I still have something to say about your life to get you to heaven so that you'll be a partaker of the holiness of God. Look at this. It says now, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Look up for a moment. You know why the children, primary school children and secondary school children, while they submit to our correction, oh, because they know that I still have to depend on daddy and mommy for breakfast, for lunch, and for supper. And so, if they correct me now, and I rebel and reject, the consequence is 
my stomach will be hungry. And so I stay. And they are counting years that soon I come out of school. Once I come out of school, I'm not going to allow this, but I have to allow it now because otherwise, how would I eat? They know that we have to pay school fees. And they know the school fees is not something you can now walk on the sides and then be going to school. The school fees now is high. And because of that, if daddy says, hey, my boy, you cannot do this. They don't like it on the internal, inside, but they can't talk because I don't want daddy to say he will not pay school fees. I don't want to waste my life on any child that will not obey me and all that. So I submit because he has to pay school fees. He has to give shelter. So for these few days, I allow him. But after the school fees has been paid and we have eaten and we have clothes and now we have come out of youth service and we have bought a car now and then we are by ourselves and we are independent if daddy says hey what you used to say nothing different my boy how about this how about it daddy that's what i will do ah uh -uh. are you the one talking to me yes sir you know why because now he can take breakfast without daddy and mommy. Because now he has shelter accommodation before, because daddy and mommy do not have to go to that. And then he can wear clothes and do anything. And therefore he says, this is what I'm going to do. He couldn't say that before. But you know God, God has a thousand and one ways to bring you to your knees. And he says, heaven, have a place for you in heaven. Have a seat for you there. Have a mansion for you there. And the way you are acting, that place will be vacant. And that place will not be vacant. If I'm going to drag you, if I'm going to push you, if I, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to fit you for that place. That's the reason why he goes on. Because you can't, re you can't react to God like you are to your earthly parents. He for our profit our profit. That's why he makes that correction until we become partakers of his holiness. It's not um, joyous for the present time. Nevertheless, afterward, it shieldeth a peaceable fruit of righteousness. I'm looking at uh, Leviticus chapter 26. Leviticus chapter 26 and see the way God acts. In Leviticus chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 14. It says, But if ye will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and if ye despise my statutes, and if your soul abhor my judgment, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but will break, but ye break my covenant, also, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and burning egg, and uh, that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and ye shall sow your seed in vain, and your enemy shall eat it. And I will set my face against you. And ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you. And ye shall flee when none pursueth. Look at verse 18. And if ye will not yet for this, all this hacking unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. He's saying, I'm doing this for you to hack into me. I'm, I'm your creator. I'm your redeemer. I'm the one that got you out of the land of Egypt. I'm doing this to you so that you will listen to me. I merit your attention. And he says, I do this, and if you will not yet for that, hack into me, then I will punish you more seven times. Look at verse 19. I will break the pride of your power. That's what he wants to break, the pride of your power. And I will, I will make your heaven as iron, and your earth as brass, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, 
neither shall the trees of the land yield her fruit. Look at verse 21. If ye walk contrary unto me, that is, after he has done all that, after he has corrected, our earthly parents, you know, they easily gave up. Well, the, the man is going on. So you this say this uh, young people now this one they go to university. We don't know what they teach them there. And once they teach them all this, uh, whatever they are teaching them, they become so hard. Okay, I will not have my pretension because of you. That's the way you want to live. Okay, go your way, not God. Because God cannot have hypertension. Because God cannot get sick. Because God cannot be conquered or defeated. Therefore, it says, I do this to you, change. If you don't change, I'll do this again. If you don't change, I'll do this again. Because he will not lose his purpose. He has a purpose. Look at verse 21. And if he were contrary unto me, I will not hearken unto me. I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins i will also send wild bees among you which shall rob of you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highway shall be desolate and if ye will not be reformed by all these that is you know he said i've done this i've done this i've done this and still you will not be reformed he said he's not going to give up i want to sleep give up yeah, what can we do? She's already 21. What can we do? She's already decided she's going to marry that person. And, you know, whatever we say, you know, she's not even paying attention. You can see her eyeballs rolling. She is daydreaming. So, let her go. But God does not allow that. He doesn't say, let her go. Let him go. Look at verse 23. And if he will not be reformed by me, by all these, and will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you, and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. And if I will, and I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. Look at what God says. He says, you are quarreling with me. It's a quarrel of my covenant. I give you a covenant and you quarrel with me. And you say, no, we don't want your covenant. No, we don't want your status. No, we don't want this. And you must keep to that covenant to be holy. And you need that holiness for, to get to heaven. And if you don't get to heaven, what's the purpose that I've labored on you? I created you. I redeemed you. And I'm, in our own case now, he sent his only begotten son to die for us on the cross of Calvary. He healed our body. He promoted us. He did a lot of things. And he says, but the goal is to take you to heaven and then you are doing things that you are not allowed to get to heaven. No way. I must keep on. If you quarrel with my covenant, I will keep on doing this until you submit. Because when man quarrels with God, who is going to win? I said he's going to win. Look at Pharaoh. God won. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. God won. Look at Belshazzar. God won. Look at Herod. God won. How is it that man will say, I know this is what God wants, but I'll keep fighting. You know, you cannot keep on fighting because that heaven, you'll get there in Jesus' name. And it's going to take holiness because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And he wants you to be partakers of his holiness. Look at what it says in verse 25. And I will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you. And ye shall be delivered unto the hand of the enemy. And, I will, and, and, and when I have broken the stone half of your bread. Ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and then shall deliver you your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat and not be satisfied. And if ye will not for all this, hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you in fury. It says, no, I'm not going to be the first one to stop. I'm going to keep on doing it until you understand that I am God. I'm the Almighty. I'm the ancient of this. And it says, then I will contrary unto you, also in fury, and I even I will chastise you. That's the word. Chastise you seven times. 
for your sins. I pray that as God corrects us, we take to correction in Jesus' name. Uh, we're looking at uh, Psalm 119. Psalm 119, uh, I'm reading from verse 67. Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 67. It says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. The psalmist recognized it's my fault. God is not taking pleasure in giving me affliction. But before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I've kept that word. Look at verse 71. It is good for me. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. It says, now I realize, now I realize the hand of God was heavy upon me because there was something I didn't learn. There was something I should have learned, learned and I didn't learn. And it said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. And I'm reading from verse 75. In verse 75, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. Thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 9. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. Look at this. When thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. When thy judgments are in the earth, then the inhabitants of the earth they will learn righteousness. God has spoken once. Uh-uh. They don't learn. God has spoken twice. Uh-uh. They don't learn. God has sent his servants, the prophets, to preach to them. No. They will not learn. And God has spoken to them in their conscience. No. They will not learn. And their neighbors have said, uh-uh. We thought you are a child of God. We thought you are a deeper life. We thought you are this. And yet they will not learn. But now, when thy judgments are on the, in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Look at verse 10. Let favor be showed to the wicked. Yet will he not learn righteousness. You have a good intention. You're saying... He is not saved because he doesn't have food. So we give him food. But surprise, he's still not saved. Okay. He cannot pay the school fees of his children. That's why he cannot pay attention. He says, well, I cannot do I cannot do this. You're calling me to church. Then we help him to pay the school fees of his children. Still, he will not bulge, he will not yield. Or maybe he's any of our children, and uh, you know, they complain to somebody who is not, uh, you know, in the family, and they say, you know, my daddy is not caring for me, he's not doing this, not doing. And then the people come to the parents, they say, you know, your boy, you know, your girl is not cooperating to follow you and to be serious and to be spiritual and to be saved because that child confided in me. It's because daddy is not doing this for me. Mommy is not doing this for me. Okay, is that so? All right, if that is the case, if this will bring him to the Lord and then you, you know, shovel money, shovel clothes and shuffle this and shuffle that to him and the boy or the girl is now living like in luxury. And then you're expecting that. Now he will repent. Now he will give his life to the Lord. But no. Why? Look at this in verse 10. Let favor be showed to the wicked. Yet will he not learn, will he not run, learn righteousness. In the land of, the, of, of uprightness he will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. You see what it says there? Just giving money to people doesn't make them change. Giving material things doesn't make them change. Money to people has value within a short time. 
You give somebody money and then he appears to appreciate it and everything is good. But after one week, all that, you know, wins away. It doesn't look at that value. You have to give again. And then when you give again, after one month, you know, it doesn't appreciate because the money has finished. Then you have to give again. But God knows how to get them. He will get them. I said he will get them. You know, as the Lord is, he himself is telling us, he says, don't despise the chastisement of the Lord because he's doing this so that you'll be partakers of his holiness. He tells us um, in James chapter 4, James chapter 4, the response we ought to have to this a good uh, investment of God in our lives is chastisement to lead us to rethinking and rethinking thoughtfulness to lead us to repentance and that repentance to lead us to restoration and then to lead us to righteousness you know the prodigal son would never have come back home if his belly was full if his clothes were there if the shelters were there if the friends never forsook him he would never have returned but in the far country when he was hungry when he came to tatters rags and when it appears all the friends are forsaking him that's the time he said uh, how many of my father's servants have enough to eat and i perish with hunger in this place is the hunger is the chastisement it is the rebuke, it is the correction that he felt in his body that made him to say, I will arise and go back home. And I will tell my father, whatever, at least I want food. Whatever, at least I need shelter. That's why he returned. And that's why God many times will deal with us in this way. But you know what? There are some people that do not know the finger of God. And they do not know the ways of God. Once the prodigal son is feeling a little bit hungry, they'll say, this is a pastor so and so son. He must not suffer. And then they give him the food. If the hunger had continued, that young man would have repented long ago. If the hunger had continued, that lady would have left all those boys and then come back home and come back to the Lord. Well, because there are people that do not know the fingers of God. They do not know that God is correcting this boy. God is chastising this girl. And they come to there and they're giving money because of so and so. Because of such and such. Because of this and that. And they're giving and giving. And they cannot bear to see these prodigal sons and these prodigal daughters getting hungry and what they do is making them to remain in their far country. But if we say, God, is this your hand? God, is this your will? God, are you the one rebuking this individual? God, are you the one doing this? And God says, yes, leave me with him. You see, all the time they were protecting Jonah. All the time they kept him there and they were rowing and rowing. Nothing changed. And uh, Jonah did not reciprocate their love until they threw him into the sea. He was now alone by himself and he knew that uh -huh, God is at war with me. He said, he that for I forsook my mercy. I left the way of salvation. He said, I will pay my vows. He said, salvation is of the Lord. And then that's when the change came. I pray you understand what God is teaching us today. Understand it for yourself. Understand it for other people. And the Lord will bring a lot of people back into the fold in Jesus' name. I'm looking at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit yourself. It's rebuking you, just correcting you, whatever. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in a sight of the Lord, tell me the rest and he shall lift you up he'll lift you up in Jesus name, how do we respond to all this, I'm coming to point number 3 now our fervent prayerful consecration 
with humility. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down. Look up for a moment. You know, there are people that think, if I like, I'll be a walker. If I don't like, I'll not be a walker. If I like, I'll be active. If I don't like, if something displeases me, I leave their work for them. I hang my hands down. And I'll not do anything. If I like, I go for my business. If I don't like, I, you know, just leave everything. If they appreciate the service I give, I'll be active. If not, I will teach them a lesson and I will abandon their house fellowship to them. I will abandon their local location church to them. I will abandon the district church to them. If I don't like, if I don't feel good, don't feel all right, I will leave all the work. I'll hang my hands down. Go and ask Jonah. If I like, if I don't like. There is no liking or not or liking here. The, you are compelled. Necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. The only way you can have an easy life after God has called you. After God has marked you down and he has said, this is the way, walk here therein. The only way you can have peace of mind. And the only way things will be all right, go and ask them. The people who are pastors, the people who are preachers, go and ask them. The people that were counseling us, the people that were very active in the work of the Lord, and then something happened. Maybe one woman somewhere attracted them, distracted them, and now they are gone away from the work of Go and ask them. There's no peace there. The people, maybe it's because of business. They have to travel to China, Japan, Hong Kong, and so on. Because of that, the work of God is lying fallow. It's not been go and ask them. That's what he told Haggai. He said, Tell the people, you so much, you bring in little. He said, I'm the one. Doing, God said, I'm the one doing that. He said, Go and ask them that you are running to your houses, you are building your houses, and my house is not built as long as that is there. He says, I'm the one walking against you. But he said, Bring the wood and bring the silver and bring the gold. And then they brought and he said, you tell them, from this day I will bless you. I thought you will say amen. amen. You see, is God fighting against the rebellious? I will not allow God to fight with me. You know, there are people that might tell me and say, we learned that you are now of this age. Why don't you retire? They want to get me into trouble. They want uh, God to say, what are you doing there? And then, what will I tell you? I am sleeping. Ah, I made you strong at this age. I give you strength at this age. And you are sleeping and you'll see what will happen. I will not retire. <laughs> say it for yourself. You will work for the Lord. And the favor of the Lord will be showered upon your life. You know, he will bless you and bless you and bless you until you will say, Lord, that's enough. While he's fighting with other people, he will favor your life. Because you commit your life, commit everything you have into the work of God, the favor of God will never leave your life. Look at look at it. Look at verse. Uh, look at verse uh, twelve again. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feebleness, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. You know, tonight if you're sick. And God has been saying, well, that sickness is not just ordinary. It's me that is not, you know, fulfilling my promise to your life. But wants to say, Lord, I am sorry. Everything I dropped, I'll pick up your walk again. The life you want me to live, I will live that life again. Immediately you say that, a miracle will come upon your life. And then you follow peace with all men. And holiness without which... No man shall see the Lord. Somebody there, you'll see the Lord. That's why he's going to do everything to make sure that you are partaker of his holiness. You know, tonight, number one, examine yourself. Look at your life. 
is the anger of God there? Is the fury of God there? Is the chastisement of God there? Is the correction of God there? Is there a lack there? Is there like you are quarreling with the covenant of the Lord and things are not easy? Examine yourself. Number two, listen to the Spirit's pleading. He's pleading with you. Nobody ever fought with God and won. Your conscience tells you. The messages tell you. Our songs tell you. The dreams tell you. Listen to the Spirit's pleading. Three, despise not divine correction. Don't be hard. God loves you. And God wants to favor you. He wants your heart to be soft, to be submissive. He wants you to be willing, a willing servant. And so, despise not divine correction. For recognize the rod. Recognize the rod. Were it not for whatever it is, all those things should not be crawling upon you. Why it not for whatever it is? All those things should not be heard of in your life. Affliction here, sleeplessness there, heartache there, hypertension there, and diabetes there, and incurable disease there. Church, people of God, if we were up and running, if we were not going out, money, money, money. And now God's okay, money, okay, get the money. And then we're spending the money on hospitals and this and that. And the time the money comes in, because we abandon God, we abandon his work to go and get the money. And then after getting the money, God says, okay, if money is greater than who I am and what my work is, get the money. And look at how we're spending the money. Look at the pain. Look at the heartache. Look at the suffering. Why don't we recognize the road? I know us appointed the road and say, God, I'll give you number one place in my life. I'll give you number one place in my time. I'll give everything I've got. And I'm telling you that within a moment of time, things will turn around in your life. That you say, I will serve God. And I know God will permit me to use this language. God will serve you. I thought you will say amen. amen. Examine yourself. Listen to the Spirit's pleading. Despise not divine correction. Recognize his rod. Return to him with all your heart. No reservation. No looking back. No giving condition to God. Lord, I will serve you. If it's only one person that gives a hundred percent of what, what he has to serve you, I will be that one person. God will surprise you with signs and wonders. And then you partake of his holiness. Bend your head, bend your heart, bend your life, and submit totally to the Lord. You are partaker of his holiness, and then you prepare for heaven. No fight with anybody. Give me a good amen. amen. No quarrel with anybody. Another amen. amen. Peace with all men. And you follow the prince of peace. And in that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You say, Lord, I thank you. I feel it in my heart. I feel it in my soul. He has given that holiness once again. This time, I will live with it. And be at peace with all men. Your life will be a wonder. Yeah. And it can start tonight. I said it will start tonight. Yeah. Are you there? Yeah. Where are you? Are you ready? Yeah. God will bless you. Yeah. Come to the Lord. You stand up and say, Lord, I surrender. All to Jesus I surrender. No quarreling with God. No fighting with God. No contradiction to God. I just want to serve God. And the Lord will surprise you. Your life will turn around. 
stand up and talk to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. Lord, here I am. I will serve you. I will serve you. I must serve you. There's no other thing to do. This will be number one in my life, serving the Lord. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.